and welcome back, as they say in the trade. You're uh, watching the uh, Spectator uh, Health Summit, and thank you so much uh, for doing it. And, and my thanks to MSD for sponsoring the whole event. Now, before the break, we were having a, a panel discussion about the NHS and the shortfalls that have been ex exposed uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, some of them structural, some of them functional, uh, and some of them, uh, though very few of them, to do with the money side of things. And, and that panel kept referring to the care sector as well. And I kept saying, we're going to talk about that in detail next, which is precisely what we are going to do. The vulnerability of the care sector. Uh, and to be brutally honest, after a decade of dither uh, following Dilnot, and now nine months of COVID-19, in many cases, misjudgments, uh, those shortfalls have been exposed in even greater uh, detail. The virus itself swept through uh, care homes, uh, causing further instability in the structure of that service, uh, as well as taking lives uh, all too soon. Half of pensioners are refused help by local councils, causing problems that, that later place further strain on the uh, NHS. Record numbers of elderly people are being admitted with malnutrition, and a thousand dementia sufferers enter hospital daily as emergency cases. Now, although the cost of care can mean selling your home, care workers themselves are often paid the minimum wage. So how do we better protect the vulnerable in care homes? How do we ensure a better integration between the private bits of care and the state provision uh, of care? And how can we fund a better system that's been talked about for years and years, but as I said, has been a decade of prevarication and delay. To help me and help you understand some of these issues and to explore possible solutions, I'm delighted to be joined by Caroline Abrahams, the Charity Director at Age UK, by Martin Green, the Chief Executive of Care England, by Natasha Curry, who's the Deputy Director of Policy at the Nuffield Trust, and by Paul Burstow, uh, himself a former Minister for Care and now Chair of the Social Care Institute for Excellence. Thank you all very much indeed uh, for joining all of us. Um, a reminder to people who are listening to this conversation, you can ask a question of any of those panellists uh, by writing in the text box at the bottom of the screen or by emailing us, uh, and the address for that is events at spectator.co.uk. So let's begin with the headlines. Uh, what, in your view, panel, uh, is the most pressing challenge uh, to the care sector? Caroline. Tough question, actually, Alistair, because you could pick so many. I think it's a toss up between people and money. And of course, the two are in inextricably linked. So we know that social care is a people business. It's all about what I do for you, whether that's helping you get washed or dressed or, or if you're a young disabled person helping you uh, get out and live your life. It's about people and there aren't enough of them. As simple as that really. Uh, in fact there are loads not enough of them. We've got more than 112,000 vacancies in the workforce every day and I'm afraid to say we're about to make it worse uh, because of the rules that the government's intending to implement around Brexit and the fact that we're going to say that in the future um, people who might want to come to work here as care workers from our nearest neighbours in the EU won't be able to do that anymore. So that feels to me like shooting ourselves in the foot. Whether you're a Lever or a Remainer makes no difference. I think most people want their mum to be well looked after and we're making that harder. And that seems to me daft. All right, uh, loud and clear. People and money, not enough people uh, and uh, being made potentially more difficult because changes uh, over Brexit and, and immigration policy. Um, how does it feel, Martin Green, uh, uh, with your Care England hat upon? What do you see as being the most pressing uh, issues right now? I think Caroline's absolutely right. It is about money and people. Though I would say, uh, Alistair, you talked about 10 years. Well, actually, it's been 21 years since Tony Blair asked Lord Sutherland to find a solution to long-term care. So I think one of the challenges is this has been pushed into the long grass for 
far too long. I also think one of the things we've got to do is craft a new vision for social care. So we talk a lot about money, we talk a lot about people, but we need to recalibrate social care. At the moment, what happens is you only get social care when you're in a crisis, and usually you get it when you can no longer make improvements. So it is very much that deficit model. And I think we've got to go to an asset model, we've got to go to a life course model. And I also want to say just finally, I really want to reclaim that term integration, uh, because when people talk about it, they talk about the NHS, they talk about social care, they talk about local authorities. And in my view, this misses the point. What you see as true integration is the experience of the person who uses a service. Actually, what's going on in the background should be the mechanism to deliver people a good life. And I use as my analogy there the airline industry. When I sit on a plane, I don't know when I go out of Austrian airspace into German airspace, there's a massive administrative process, but I experience a flight from A to B. And this should be the holy grail of how we manage an integrated system to look at the success measures and measure them in terms of a person's experience Experience, not the processes that go on behind the scenes. Uh, fascinating and, and brilliant analogy. Um, I seem to remember uh, that the uh, it's an analogy that's been used in the climate change debate as well about uh, carbon not recognising borders. It just it just but it's a very very good one on uh, uh, between the care sector uh, and the NHS. Um, Natasha, Deputy Director of Policy at Nuffield Trust. We've heard. Uh, powerful arguments there, as it were, from the uh, the end user, uh, represented brilliantly by Age UK, uh, by the providers, represented uh, there by Martin. What do you see as being the most pressing issues for the care sector? I know Martin, I've uh, uh, summed it nicely. It's about people and it's about money. But Martin's point about a lack of vision is really key to this, because if we look back over the last 21 years of failure to bring about change what we see is a, a kind of pattern a cycle of proposals being put forward about funding that then become very quickly politically toxic um, and I think we need to get beyond that funding debate we need to take it out of, of that sphere out of that very politically toxic sphere and create a vision for the sort of service that you or I might want if, if we um, develop care needs and it, it needs to be a positive framing of that it needs to be about a service that we want to enable people to live independent lives and I think that's the starting point and I think we've repeatedly started in the in the wrong place um, and I think Martin picked up on on an interesting issue about people's understanding of social care and the fact that not many people really understand what it is until they they need it it's not like the NHS where we have contact with it from day one and we're very familiar with it you tend to only find out about social care when you need it and you're in a crisis and that fuels a, a, a low public awareness of how the system works the fact that it's not free at the point of use um, and the problems in the sector so it, become, it comes as a, a nasty shock to many people that it's not free when they when they need it and so I think when we look back at the the proposals uh, around election time, 2010, 2017, for example, we've seen politicians putting forward proposals for funding reform, which has been met by uh, public outcry, because I think a lot of words, about 40% of people think that the service is free at the moment. So when they see a proposal for a funding uh, reform that involves them maybe contributing some more money, they think that's a service being taken away from them. So I think there's, there's a couple of issues here. It's about public awareness and raising that. And then it's about some strong political leadership at the, at the centre to really create a positive vision to, to build that support. And then the other point I just want to throw in here is that we need that, that framing, that vision to understand the complexity of social care. Too often, I think the debate is very narrow. It's boiled down to older people, care homes and people selling their houses. Actually, half of, of public spending on, on social care is among working age adults and a huge amount of care is delivered in people's homes. So I think we just need to, to nuance the debate and, and to, to, uh, to appreciate the complexity of it. Thank you very much indeed. Um, before I bring Paul in, I, let me just test you on one aspect of that, Natasha, because I don't want to misrepresent you. Is the pounding heart of what you've just said that come up with a vision for what care should look like in an ideal and then cost it. Learning over the last 20 years has shown that trying to cost something before defining it, it has, it's a fundamental problem. 
And we've not been able to build support, political or public support for change. Okay. And I think that's where we've fallen down. Gotcha. I just wanted to make sure that was crystal clear because that's a pretty fundamental thing. Um, Paul, good, uh, good of you to join us as well. Paul Burstow, former Minister for Care. Um, Martin says it's not, not a decade uh, of delay post Dilnot, which is a wonderful alliteration, but it's 21 years of delay uh, since Tony Blair first uh, said we need to do better. Um, what, what's your snapshot, Paul, uh, uh, of the the state of social care and the fundamental challenge that we all face? Um, all three of your previous speakers have very perfectly painted uh, the picture, which uh, if we'd been having this event 10 years ago, 20 years ago, <coughs> would probably have been painted then as well. Uh, with maybe some subtle nuances to the picture, but it would have been essentially the same picture. Uh, an underpaid workforce, an underfunded system, uh, a system that most people know nothing about until they find themselves in it, uh, and uh, an overfixation of one particular flaw in the current system, which is that some people have to sell their homes to pay for care. So I, I think there's just two or three things I would say about what the, the principal challenge is. The principal challenge is political will and its singular absence. Uh, it's been absent really for the last 30 years. The nearest we came, I think, in the last 30 years to any significant reform was through the CARE Act. CARE Act uh, provided at least the ability to implement the Dilnot proposals. The Dilnot proposals would not have solved all of the problems. It was still left issues of how you raise sufficient money to pay for a, uh, the, the state-backed state part of the care system. Uh, but it would have made some aspects of it fairer. And I think it would have brought more people into an awareness uh, of what our social care system is. So I think there's two or three things I would say. One is that it's not good enough simply to better fund the current status quo. So I agree with Martin's point. We do need a, a fundamental shift of emphasis to upstream uh, preventative approaches to this, not least because we're not just simply talking about an aging population, some of whom will need uh, long-term care and support but many of whom with the right support at an earlier stage in their lives will be able to avoid much of the need for that care. And secondly, there's an issue about the working age population, which Natasha has talked about, uh, which often goes overlooked. And yet if we look at the uh, figures that have been published by Public Health England, if you are a person living with a learning disability, the likelihood of your vulnerability and death from COVID is massively higher than many other parts of the population largely I think still under understated. So uh, for me it's fundamentally political will. Where does the block sit? The block sits in Her Majesty's Treasury. The Department of Health and Social Care has developed proposals numerous times. Uh, there are only a finite number of solutions to this set of questions. Uh, they've all been offered in one form or another over the last 30 years. The Treasury has systematically trashed each one of them because it is really I think very much of the view regardless of who's in government that this is an issue which it can be seen as a can that can be kicked down the road uh, and one that the government shouldn't take the bill for. Absolutely fascinating and, and thank you very much indeed for that um, and, and you uh, Paul and also um, I think it was Natasha mentioning the the working age uh, population and, and, and the fact that they also uh, make demands upon the the care system. But I'm, I'm going to stick with you, Paul, because you said that there was a need for uh, political, it was all about political will, as much as it was, you agreed with people and money, of course, that mattered, but political will. Uh, what proposals specifically then do you think need to be made? Because you, you said the Care Act got a lot of it right, that progress was being made, that there was a need for more money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Boris Johnson's put Camilla Cavendish in there uh, as, as the new, as it were, care czar. Uh, Camilla is a, a former think tank uh, official, a great writer, has written very movingly about aging and, and, and about care as well. What specifically does she need to add to the equation so that she can take a costed proposal as Natasha talked about as well to Rishi Sunak and say, come on guys, we've got to do this and we've got to do it now. What, what's the missing bit that, that Cavendish can add? The missing bit uh, I think that uh, Cavendish can add uh, is uh, to ensure that the prime minister stays the course, that the prime minister provides the political capital that's necessary to get a measure through the treasury 
uh, and then take it through uh, its political and parliamentary processes as well. I think fundamentally, this is not a question of how much it costs. Uh, it's not a question of uh, those issues at all. In fact, in terms of the timing, um, I would say in the, the wake of 2020, where the sums of public money that have been allocated to address the challenge of COVID dwarf any of the costs of a comprehensive, of the most comprehensive and most generous form of reform uh, of social care, fully taxpayer funded system would be dwarfed by the costs that we've incurred in the last 12 months. So um, I think what you need now is uh, the prime minister to get behind uh, whatever uh, Camilla Cavendish comes up with, as long as it does pull risk across society, as long as it does create a fairer system of paying for social care and one that everyone feels that is uh, actually going to deliver the right care for them at the right time in the right place and goes upstream and prevents uh, need arising in the first place. All right, Natasha, you talked about come up with the right vision and then cost it. In terms of specific policy proposals, do we have the right agenda that that, that you and Paul Burstow and, and, and others can take to Boris Johnson or Camilla Cavendish and say, look, here, here's plan A. This is, this is what needs to be done. And by the way, it's going to cost X, which Paul Burstow says will, uh, is, is a number that is absolutely dwarfed by what you've been spending on COVID-19. Is there a ready to go plan? Not that I've heard of. I, I, if you're talking about at the, the Department of Health, I, I don't think so. I mean, there are many voices in this sector and that's part of the complexity. And, and that's why I think we need a real, a really strong leadership at the centre, somebody who is able to, to listen to all of those voices that, that, that um, understands the complexity of the system to put in place that, that wider vision. And I think Paul's right, the CARE Act took us some of that way, but that vision really needs restating and, 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 and putting out there and, and garnering wider public support so not just amongst the people who are now using services but the wider public who we need their support to be able to bring about this change so i don't think we've got to step one really i don't think we have a unified vision really that's widely understood across the, the political divide that we can build support around amongst the public and until we have that i don't think we can we can cost it i mean we have sort of estimates that people have put forward based on the current system and previous funding models, etc. But I don't think we have a clear enough vision yet to be able to say this is what we, we want in a service. This is how much it costs. And this might be the share of responsibility between the state and individuals. I, I don't think we're there yet. All right, Caroline Abrams, you've got a problem. Because Burstow says all you need to do is win over the Prime Minister, get him to back Cavendish. Uh, and and we're, we're more than halfway there. Natasha says there isn't a plan. There isn't a clear cut demand. You on behalf of uh, particularly uh, people who have reached retirement age and beyond, Age UK, it does what it says on the tin. Um, why haven't we got a plan? Why don't we know what we want? We do know, know what we want, but it's the mechanics of how you get it that's in, in question, I think. So, well, well Paul uh, Burstow says you merely go to the Prime Minister, get his attention, uh, and Natasha says get the detail of the plan absolutely <laughs> right and then put the price tag on it later. Yeah, um, well, but she says we don't have a plan. You say we do. What is the plan? Uh, well, what older people want is they want social care to be there for them. They want it to be reliable. Actually, perfectly reasonable, sensible things that we would all want, really. At the moment, you know, 1.6 million older people have care needs and aren't having them met. So that, that's the, uh, another example of how bad the system is at the moment. Uh, they're prepared to pay something towards it um, that they can afford. So, you know, the, the will from older people is there. They're not, they're not naive about the fact that this is going to cost a lot of money. Um, but, it, but, but it gets stuck, as Paul says, because, because there's no votes in it if you're in government. That's what they think. In fact, they think it's a vote loser. And the last, um, the last uh, time that when Theresa May tried to uh, bring some reforms forward, you know, she, she got very badly burned, as we all know. And that's that I think strikes fear throughout all politicians. But you know, in a way, I was thinking about this. We're we're sort of in the same position that education was in in the 19th century. We've got a a fundamental, basically, public service here that deals with some, you know, millions and millions of all of us um, as we get older. Not 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 only us, but also working age disabled people as well. 
And we're still running it like a cottage industry, essentially. There's no, uh, the, I mean, one of the things that's come through the pandemic is that when ministers have tried to help social care, they found it awfully difficult because the Department of Health didn't even have a list of all the care homes there are. You know, there's no, the, there's a total lack of structure and 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 organisation. And other countries are, are showing that you can you don't have to nationalise everything. You can just have a firm framework within which things work. Natasha is a consummate expert on Germany, and that's what they've done. Um, and I think that's what we should do. That is a plan. There are plenty of good examples to draw on right around the world. Germany probably being the best. And if we did Germany here, I think AGK would be very happy. Um, Martin Green, do you think there's a plan? Uh, well, I don't think there's a plan. And I think partly because if you looked at this from the premise of what we need to achieve, you would look at it across health and social care. And the problem in this country is you have health in one silo, social care in another. It is absolutely toxic for any politician to start talking about reapportioning resources across the system, mm. because that translates within the public's mind as you're trying to get rid of the health service, or you're going to privatise it, or you're trying to cut it. And actually, if you look at the reasons why people need social care, they need them because they've got health conditions. So I do think we should have a proper discussion about the amounts of money that are going into health and social care and how we apportion it. And that does not mean that the NHS takes over social care. And one of the things that we are really in a problem here is that everybody talks about organisations and they need to shift their focus from organisations um, and structures to people and outcomes. And actually, if we use the money across both bits of the system much more effectively, we wouldn't be going to the Chancellor and asking for quite as much as we currently are. And partly one of the challenges is that the Chancellor sees how much money has gone into what he considers to be the system, because everybody tells us it's all integrated. And in reality, it's gone into one silo and rather than the other. So I do think there is a real need for an adult conversation about how we restructure things that are fit for purpose in the 21st century, not in the 19th and 20th century century. And let me press you on that and then I'm going to ask the other three to come back in on it because I think that's a fundamental point. Um, uh, Martin Green, you're basically saying that, that and I, I don't want to divide you, but I want to make a distinction here, that, that, that when Natasha uh, says come up with a vision for what care should be like and then cost it and go to the government or what have you, it seems to me what you're saying is that the absolute first and foremost ambition when trying to deal with the demands of the care sector is that issue of integration, how care and the NHS work together, not so much what is being done for better or for worse in some places brilliantly, in some places not so well within the care silo. To you, the absolute priority is integration. Am I, am I right? Uh, well, the absolute priority is delivering what people need when they need it and delivering it at a time. That can only level. be done with a properly integrated NHS stroke care system. Yeah, it can, well, it can be done with an integrated approach to the funding of a health and social care system. Okay, so again, fine. focusing on outcomes, not on the organisations and delivering it at a time. That can only level. be done with a properly integrated NHS stroke care system. Yeah, it can, well, it can be done with an integrated approach to the funding of a health and social care system. Okay, so again, fine. Paul Burstow. And Martin's right that uh, certainly part of the uh, answer here is to have a more joined up approach, both at a national level in terms of the outcomes that we're trying to achieve uh, nationally in terms of the way in which resources flow. Um, you know, we have uh, not just silos at a local level, we have silos at a national level. You have uh, funding for social care, goes through uh, the housing and communities and local government ministry uh, and uh, the policy for social care sits with the Department of Health and Social Care. Uh, an immediate fracture there which makes it quite difficult to uh, affect change. Uh, and then you have uh, the NHS funding which again is, is very jealously guarded uh, by the NHS when it comes to the way in which uh, they view that money being used. And yet if you took the principle of the CARE Act which was all about promoting <coughs> individual well-being uh, and focusing on that and made that a common organizing purpose of both health and social care mm. i think you would begin to break down some of these silos it wouldn't be sufficient of itself but i think it will be an important cultural and behavioral 
shift that we need to see at a local level. And I say that as the chair of an integrated care system where we are and have seen during the pandemic amazing collaboration across yeah. health and social care, uh, not just between the public sector part of it, but with um, the private sector as well. We need to make sure that some of those, uh, if you like, wartime experiences of collaboration uh, to uh, make sure that we organise around the common purpose carry on now as we come out of the pandemic. Natasha. I mean, I think um, integrated care systems are an opportunity here to bring about real integration between health and social care. I think too often social care is seen as an adjunct to the NHS. It's a support service and not a, a service of value in itself. And I completely agree with Martin when when we're talking about integration, I don't think we're talking about the NHS taking over social care. It's a service in, in and of its own right. Um, and it, it doesn't just need to be integrated with health. It's also closely related to housing and, and community services. So I think it's absolutely right that it sits in the local government sphere. But we do need the services working together and we need to be thinking about them as one. And I think what in the early months of COVID, what we really saw was that fracture between the two systems. And, and the other thing that I think was really highlighted is that it is a focus on on health and an absence of focus on the NHS throughout the entire system. So at the, at the centre and that filters, filters down. And I think that's something that we need addressing. Um, so we need a, a real capacity and capability at the centre to, to really bring this about. And then that flow down to, to integrated care systems. Um, obviously that's a, it's the, creating an integrated care system with local government around the table as an equal partner has challenges and barriers, but I think there is an opportunity here to, to really bring that about. And finally, Caroline, I mean, as it were, you're a charity raising money to support folk as they uh, enter into their uh, their later years and, and, and live through that period. Um, in a sense, they are the acid test uh, as to whether or not it works. Does, in, is it your view that that integration, that notion of integration is at the pounding heart of it? Um, or, or is it just a gentle segue? No, I think um, as we've learned throughout this session, really, social care does different things for different people. Mm. But for older people, as Martin has said, actually, almost everybody who's an older person who needs social care needs it because their health is going downhill, which happens to us very often as we get older. We've got millions of people living with multiple long term conditions now, things that would have killed them 20, 30 years ago. It's a great it's a great thing that now people are able to stay alive with cancer in a way they weren't before very often, but they need extra help. And so actually for those sorts of people, uh, getting as joined up a service as possible right around them works really well. We've seen it, I've personally seen it. There, it happens at all kinds of different levels of the system. For example, there are joined up um, teams now which work out of some hospitals to help people stay out of hospital when they don't need to come in. Because, you know, hospital's great if you need it, if you're an older person, but it can be quite dangerous if it's not. And in those teams, which are clinically led, you see um, social workers, physios, OTs, clinicians, nurses, they all work together in a democratic way. It works really well. And, you know, equally community services, which I think we've just touched on, absolutely crucial in this. District nurses help to keep older people going. But at the moment, there's this very firm demarcation between a district nurse on the one hand and a care worker on the other, which probably doesn't make sense. And I think Camilla Cavendish, as you, you mentioned earlier on, um, Alistair, I think she's, she's been very interested in some of the models that operate abroad, which, which work very differently, that give more power and control to local teams to work mm. more across those traditional divides. So we need, we do need integration at all levels. And just one final point on that, and I'm going to stay, stay with you, Caroline, if I may, because Natasha talked about in terms of that integration and what have you, she mentioned housing as well. So, so the, it, it's all of, a, uh, of a, an holistic piece, uh, as it were. That's, in my experience, that's simply good men and women doing a good job of work within their bit, whether they're a care worker or whether they're a GP or a nurse or, or, or whether they're somebody trying to sort out a housing problem. Um, does it need structural reform as well, or is it simply, you know, the will of good men and women doing the right thing? I think we need to get some of the structural barriers out of the way. Like, like yeah. my, I'm, I'm very um, interested in 
ICSs, integrated care systems, because partly because they, they mean you don't have to choose about who, who runs social care, so uh, local government or NHS. Actually, they both get round the table and talk about it in the round alongside the health provision that so many older people need. So I think that's a rather neat solution. Uh, whether it'll work out like that in practice, we'll have to see. But I think it's really promising and we're certainly supporting it. Mm -hmm. OK, fine. I, I want to move it on a little bit. We've got a, we've got about another 15 minutes, um, maybe 20 minutes or so. There is a very obvious underlying problem, and that is unfairness. Um, and whether that's naivety or poor journalism, I don't know, but that, that's the pounding heart of it um, in care. And it, it, it's the simple unfairness of the wealthy versus the poor, homeowners versus renters, savers versus non-savers. Um, let me just put it to you, all of you, life's like that. Or does it not have to be? Do you believe, whether you go back as Paul did 21 years or as I did a decade to, to deal not and what have you, that there really is a meaningful way of addressing that unfairness issue or that's the way it is and that's what we have to learn to live with? Natasha? I think we absolutely don't have to live with it and, and I think we, we can address we can address it. And as Caroline mentioned, I've been looking at different countries' approaches to this. I've looked at Germany and Japan specifically, and both countries have tried to make, to create a consistent service. I mean, you can't ever have perfect fairness, but you can certainly move towards it. But as you, as you, as you mentioned, we have an extremely variable system that's incredibly unfair. So unfair in terms of your wealth, in terms of where you live, in terms of you have access to, to family members who can help you, et cetera. There's so many levels of unfairness in our system. And we don't have to look at them. So um, one of I think there are a couple of things we could do. So the first one would be around pooling funding for this. I think that's the that's the first step. At the moment, the burden of, of costs falls on the individual if you have assets over twenty three thousand pounds. So you don't have to be particularly wealthy for you, for you to bear all of that cost. Um, so that's one unfairness. Your access to care can also um, vary according to where you live. Um, and what council you live in, how affluent they happen to be. So the other thing that we can think about that other countries have done is raise money nationally to pull that risk, but also to make sure that you have a consistency in the benefits that people receive. So in both Germany and Japan, they assess people using a national needs assessment framework. So it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter if you have dementia or if you have cancer. It doesn't matter if you have a, a carer at home, family members look after you or not. It doesn't matter if you're wealthy or poor. You go through the same needs assessment. And then the benefits that you are then entitled to is based purely on your need and nothing else. And then you can access services accordingly. So I think there are things that we can do along those lines. In, and, and I think that that model gives us a mix of Kind of a national framework but then local delivery so we can retain that the tailoring that we need to look to local needs and, and that before i bring martin in natasha that the german japanese model that's an assessment of every single individual everybody in society when they every, they get to age what 65 or 68 or whatever in, in the japanese system it is age based so you have to be 65 but in the german system you can be any age and you okay. go through it at any point in your life when you have a care need, you feel like you, you need help, you go through the same assessment. So there's a total clarity and a fairness and, and a consistency that I think we so badly lack here. And, and that's everybody. It's not simply somebody who applies uh, or a family that says, look, my dad or my granddad is coming to that point in their life. This is automatically done by the state to the citizen, for the citizen? Well, it's it's anybody can can refer themselves, anybody ah, right. at, okay. at right. the point at which they need help. Yeah, They sure. can refer themselves. Yeah. Okay. The other, the other side of this, just to throw to Martin, is around the provider side. So the other the other issue we have in our system at the moment is that providers are unstable. They're finding it hard to make ends meet. In the German and Japanese system, there's a set payment schedule, which gives the providers more certainty over the longer term. So that's another way, another mechanism we could think about to give providers a bit more certainty. Okay, thank you for that. Martin, how do you address the issue of unfairness? 
I think there are several levels to it. And I think one of the challenges is there's a great deal of ageism in our current system. So older people get a much worse deal than some others. So, for example, older people's services are always commissioned by local authorities in terms of block contracting. So they might say you're going to have a personalised care plan, but they won't, for example, say you need more. So we're going to pay more. Now, that's a marked contrast to how younger adults are treated. So I saw recently a case of a younger adult with a £2,100 a week care package and yet the lo local authority were only offering £490 per week for an older per person in residential uh, care and the person who was younger had pretty much the same cognitive functions as the older person who had an advanced dementia. So I think the issues about fairness are very complex and they run very deep. I would agree with Natasha though that we need to have a much more open system where people can refer themselves and where their needs are the drivers of the support they get. And let's think about a needs-based approach but also an assets-based approach so that it's not about what people can't do, it's about enabling them to do what they possibly can for themselves, maintaining their independence and their dignity and their autonomy over their own lives. Those are the things that we need to be focusing on, I think. Fascinating. And, and segueing neatly into Caroline, I mean, the general question about how, how in your view, Age UK's view, do you address that fundamental issue of, of, of unfairness? But, but also, if you, if you would, reflecting a little on what Natasha and Martin just said, that by assessing real need, you make sure that those who are really in need are getting what they require, but also you may just be avoiding wasting money, as it were, uh, on a challenge that doesn't yet exist. I mean, our view at AGK is that uh, social care should become free at the point of use, just as the NHS is, because if you do that, which is essentially what happens in in Germany and Japan. There could be a co-payment for people who are better off, that's not a problem. But actually, you then immediately get rid of one of the big problems about joining up health and care, which is that they're funded so very differently. And it's important to recognize that what we currently define as social care in some other countries is defined as health, and in this country used to be defined as health. So you could, there's a social care bath and a health bath, for example. Depending on the purpose, you might get it for free or not. So there's a load of jiggery pokery that essentially the treasury is overseen in order to try and keep the price down for the amount that they're actually having to fund. Uh, and we should we just need to move to a completely different place. And part of the reason we haven't, I think, I'm afraid, as, as Martin says, is ageism. That as a, as a society, probably not just our country, too. I think we've seen a lot of similar problems right across Europe, for example, in the developed world with care homes during the pandemic. Uh, out of sight, out of mind, and we haven't taken seriously enough. We've almost been in denial of the fact that we will all probably, if we're lucky, be old one day, and we will need help of some kind, some of us, uh, but we try not to think about it as a society, and it's time we had a much more grown-up conversation about that as well. Uh, Paul Burstow, uh, it seems to me that Natasha Martin, and now Caroline as well, are all focusing, in a sense, on on clarity of assessment that, 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 that as it were, a, a, an across the board solution won't necessarily address the unfairness bit as, as best one might. Whereas a specific detailed, almost risking intrusion, but a clear assessment of what citizen A, B, C, D all the way through needs is the way forward to really deal with that unfairness issue. Do you agree with that? No, 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 I don't. And I'm not certain that that's a fair characterization of what I just heard the others say, uh, if I'm honest. I think what they've said to you is that uh, you need to have a system that, in a, in a sense, promotes open access on the basis of need. Um, and uh, that the best way also to remove some of the barriers is to make that free at the point of use so that people don't feel in any way constrained of presenting when they feel they have a care need. Of course, you have to have assessment processes to determine uh, what the level of need is and what the most appropriate response to it is. Um, but again, I would go back to uh, two things. One, um, this is an area uh, of public policy that is um, cast into the shadows. It's behind a veil of ignorance. Most people do not know about uh, the truth, uh, the dirty little secret, if you like, about social care, which is that it's not free. And the means test is one of the harshest means tests we have uh, in, our, in our nation's mean testing uh, arrangements. 
And, and it's only when it, people are in it that they discover that and they get angry about it. But by the time they're angry about it, because they're also in many cases informal carers looking after mum or dad or uh, a relative of one sort or another, they're exhausted. So they don't have the energy to then go out and politically campaign for change. So that's why, you know, my point, if you're going to, if you're going to argue the case for fairness, and there's plenty of aspects of making this system fairer, and again, plenty of uh, reference points we can choose to use to build a plan that would be a long-term sustainable agenda for reform of our social care system. And we have them on our doorstep, mm. uh, even in the United Kingdom, we can look to other parts of the UK that have made more progress than England has. Um, we could uh, begin to move this forward. But you sure. won't get let, let me butt in just on that point, it's a crucial one, uh, Paul. To, to, so in a sense, it's like the old argument about means testing, um, uh, whether it's child benefit or whatever, the, you know, the argument that to make sure that those who really do need what they really need, it's better to have a open ended, everybody get, you know, there's no, oh, you don't get it, but you do system, because that's the only way of securing it. I, and I'm going to ask Natasha to come back in and respond after you've answered that. But it, that's what you're saying is, is, is an across the piece provision is the only way of avoiding unfairness, even if it means that some who don't really need as much support from the state get it. The vast majority of people would not choose to have social care if, uh, if they, um, they didn't need it, because we're talking about things that are most basic aspects of living, yeah. being helped with getting dressed, with feeding, with bathing, things that are about your personal dignity. So these are not things people opt into as some sort of freebie. Uh, they are things they have no choice but to take up because they want to be able to maintain some independence and have a quality of life. Um, the thing that's missing, I think, from this conversation at this point is something Martin said earlier on, which is that we also need to be looking back as to what we could have done differently mm. to enable people to have avoided the need for more intensive care and support in the first place. That's where uh, Caroline's absolutely right and where the potential of integrated care systems on the ground looking at those things together both the health and social care and as natasha says the housing aspects sure. by bringing those different dimensions together we have the opportunity uh, i think to actually have a really great care system in this country that really does intervene and provide support at the right time thank you paul natasha did i misrepresent you y yes i think slightly so um what i was talking about with, with the needs assessment is at the point at which you are you feel or you, you feel a family member requires help in everyday life doing the sorts of basic things that you might take for granted going out to the shops meeting friends getting dressed etc your needs would be assessed and then yeah. a care plan put in place this isn't as paul said this isn't the sort of thing that people want actively you know unless you need it i don't think mm. we're talking about misuse or overuse um i think this is about giving people the tools they need to live fulfilling yeah. lives so, so in that sense, I was halfway there that what you're talking about, Natasha, and I don't think Paul Burstow disagreed with it, although he wanted comprehensive was his keyword. But what you're talking about is application, intelligent individual assessment of need and then provision. Exactly. So uh, rather than just knock on the door, press button B and we all get exactly the same. Well, exactly. And it has tailored to your needs because this is a very you know it needs to be a very personal service and some people need very light touch care some people need intensive care it, and it changes over time it needs to be a dynamic system um but you know we need to make sure that people have the tools to lead, to lead independent lives and that's what we're talking about in terms of fairness so so in that sense i was halfway there that what you're talking about natasha and i don't think paul burstow disagreed with it although he wanted comprehensive was his keyword but what you're talking about is application, intelligent individual assessment of need, and then provision. Exactly. So uh, rather than just knock on the door, press button B, and we all get exactly the same. Well, exactly, and it has to be tailored to your needs because this is a very, you know, it needs to be a very personal service. And some people need very light touch care. Some people need intensive care, it, and it changes over time. It needs to be a dynamic system. Um, but, you know, we need to make sure that people have the tools to lead, to lead independent lives. And that's what we're talking about in terms of fairness. Sure. OK, uh, unless I see fingers wagging at me and I'm looking at Caroline now and I'm looking at Paul, so that's OK. I'm going to come back in now and just we've got about 10 minutes to go. And I, there are two issues I want to uh, address rapidly. Um, 
and, and, and the first is cost. Martin, um, I, I mentioned in the introduction the fact that care workers are poorly paid. Some uh, provision is deemed poor quality. There have been uh, various reports done upon that. In your sense, is there any way in which the industry, in inverted commas, can reduce its costs effectively without losing efficiency so that the state is more comfortable in embracing uh, what is a high cost but terribly important service? Is there any way in which costs can be reduced? Well, I don't think there is, because I think what we've just seen is that we've got um, a costing model that is completely not fit for purpose. Of course, there are ways in which we can use, for example, technology, but I, I don't want us to focus on why we use technology as being about how we reduce costs. It should be about how we improve the quality of the service to the person who receives it. Yes, there will be efficiencies, but I think we should focus on that. I also think we've got to have a really clear career path way some skills and competencies framework for social care staff and that career pathway should be about how you have a career in social care not a job you should have training qualifications and you should be remunerated appropriately and I also think that we should be looking at how we use some of the training and development monies across the entire system so the NHS gets a hundred thousand pounds a minute in public funding for training that is not available to social care yet the same people who are in the NHS are also in social care. I also think if we look at the demographics and the numbers of people we're going to need to run services in the way we do, we're not going to be able to achieve that. So we're going to have to work smarter, not harder with our workforce. And our workforce should be enabled to move across systems just as our citizens do. So I think we need a root and branch reform. We need some really proper approaches to the skills and competencies framework. We need to be rewarding people for what they do. And the complexity of what they do in the social care field is equally as complex as what they do sometimes in the NHS. So a lot of the uh, ways in which we remunerate people need to be aligned, I think, in the, in the future. I'm just, I'm going to move it on to the other panellists, but just hold there for a second, Martin, because towards the end of your comments there about um, the system um, not being fit for purpose and the need to think smarter and clever. Um, Alistair Kelman asks, what about poor broadband connectivity for those people who are now using key medical apps to... Uh, uh, to upload key health information. Uh, we need to address that if we're going to be doing uh, the sort of stuff that Martin is talking about. Thanks, Alistair Kelman, for that. What do you say, Martin? Well, I would absolutely agree. And I think one of the things that we've got to do is get the infrastructure right. I mean, I live in central London and I've got appalling broadband. Um, and frankly, if I was relying on it for everything that I do, I wouldn't be particularly happy. So what we've got to see is some infrastructure work to make things much more easy for people to use. Um, and I think this also goes to the heart of what all panelists have said. We must not see social care in a silo. Actually, if we get really good connectivity in our broadband, it helps the mother who might want to connect with the nursery it helps the older person who want to might connect with their service provider it helps everybody connect with their families so this is about a societal need and so we've got to put the foundations in place that will enable us to embrace new technologies so I think the gentleman was absolutely right to say that. Caroline uh, do you sense at all that there are areas where not necessarily costs can be saved, but, but as it were, the model can be made more cost effective because it seems to me that none of you are going to get the large amounts of money that will be required to have a properly integrated system unless there is some sense of quid pro quo. Do you, do you see any areas of give, Caroline? Well, I suppose the honest answer is not really. Uh, I mean, I think we have to accept that we've underfunded these services for the last 20, 30 years. So I think if you, if you, as my colleagues have suggested, if you bring health and social care together and you start looking at what people might need in more of a preventive way, there's always the hope that that will lead to some savings later on, the mm. best to save kind of argument around prevention. I'm not sure how strong the evidence base is for that. And I think we also have to accept that, as I've said, given that 1.6 million older people are not having their needs met at the moment, you know, this is a big bill coming down the track. There's absolutely sure. no getting away from that. The yeah. question is how we fund it. It's but not it's also, it, it's not unlike that point that was made earlier initially by Natasha, but several of you commented upon it, 
that, that with housing is a part of it as well, with, with departmental integration, as it were, but uh, in the sense of people doing the right thing and getting it right, that in itself is efficient and, well, and that in itself reduces costs. Really good housing example. Well, what we might be talking about there is having an older person having their home assessed for how safe it is before they have a fall, not after it. So let's put some grab, really cheap things like grab rails, cost about 50 quid to put a grab rail in, can stop an older person falling, breaking a hip, going into hospital and then needing social care. But we don't do that. We, we only assess after they've had the fall in very many cases, which is bonkers. Uh, and Natasha, um, th that's a classic example, isn't it? Because you were talking yourself about the Japanese and German models of, of individual assessment and Caroline there talks yeah, about the housing as well, what, what, what citizen A or B actually requires. Do you accept the point that, that to go to government and say we need integration and we do actually need to spend some more money, whether you like it or not, you, it, it is incumbent upon the care sector to come up with its proposals to make it cheaper or more cost effective? Possibly more cost effective in or or to achieve better outcomes in what we're doing yes. potentially but I think Caroline's absolutely right I mean this is a sector that's been underfunded for so long and has so much unmet need and it relies upon so many informal carers working for free to keep people ticking over I mean I think we need to accept that if we want a better service we need to pay for it um, you know, and, and where that balance sits between how much individuals are willing to pay, how much the state should pay and how we raise that money is another issue. But I think we just fundamentally, we just have to put some more money into this system and to invest in the sorts of innovations Martin was talking about and in, into better estates. I think one one area where social care could maybe show that it, it could be more cost effective or more strategic maybe is in the sort of in the, the commissioning of, of different care models. So thinking a bit more strategically and further into the future about what sort of, of care do people want in 30, 40 years time? Is it the types of care we have now or should we be thinking a bit more imaginatively about different different models? And as Caroline said, to invest more in, in the preventive side of things, which is, which is okay. not been strong. Gotcha, thank you for that. Paul, final point then and start with you. Another part of that imagination is resolving the balance between taxpayer responsibility and citizen willing to buy private insurance responsibility. Um, is that debate still alive and burning or have we resolved it? What do you see, Paul Burstow, as being the balance between my taking out insurance, a la dill not or whatever, to provide for my care in the future uh, and the person down the road saying, nope, it's for the state to do it and you help me via your taxes as well? there's nowhere on planet earth where a private insurance system to pay for long-term care has existed and flourished uh, it's it's a completely fa fallacious argument which has been disposed of on countless occasions but is trotted out by the treasury as being the way in which you can avoid taking on a, a liability um, the only insurance system that is likely to work is a social insurance model of the sort we've heard described by Natasha in Germany uh, and other models of the, that sort that have been tried around the world. Anyone who has been close to this pu public policy area for any length of time, inevitably by force of logic, realises that you have to go down routes that do involve having a conversation with the taxpayer mm. and, and how we pay for this through general taxation or other forms of taxation. Um, and that's where the problem lies, that most people don't know that this system isn't currently free. Most people don't know this system is currently unfair. Most people don't know this system is unfunded. And for those reasons, uh, that's why you need political will to actually unlock those issues and be prepared to actually have the debate with the public about sure. what a fair funded system looks like. So Natasha, interesting point that Paul Burstow makes there at the end, because in a sense, you've already made your position clear on private versus social insurance. The first thing that needs to happen in a sense is to make sure that everybody out there, be they poor rundown holes or wealthy people paying taxes, they need to know what this system is about, how it works, how it's integrated with the NHS and how better one can do uh, with that integration before saying, and therefore you need to pay X, Y, or Z. There's a huge information campaign to be done. 
low public awareness and that is one of the hurdles that's one of the hurdles we need to come across because until we get that public understanding we, we can't get the public on side and as, it, as Paul says we need to talk about general taxation and wider taxation we cannot rely on individual insurance it's as he said it's it's a complete fallacy that, that would work Germany tried it completely failed um we need to go down a, a a national revenue raising route to pool funding whether that pays for free at the point of use service or it pays for a partial service where there's cost sharing that's another question but the, the base of this has to be risk pooling on a national level Okay, Caroline, your final thought on that, on, 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 on costs and also public awareness of, of what lies ahead or, or, or doesn't lie ahead for many of them. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. It has to be a national approach. Uh, private insurance doesn't work. I'm a bit sceptical about the capacity of in some information um, campaign as well. Um, you know, even if you put loads of money behind it, the public, all of us are inundated by information every minute of every day getting people to focus on something that doesn't feel meaningful to them until they're, they're going to be in it is going to be impossible. So it does take a government with the guts, frankly, and, and the morality and the moral imperative to say, we're going to change this, this has to change, and to lead a conversation and to be prepared to take on some of those difficult arguments. Not an easy ask, I know, but uh, it probably explains why we are where we are now. <laughs> Nicely put. Final word from you, Martin. Bring that all together for me. I think um, everybody has made some really useful points and I agree with Caroline. Actually, if we get the system right, we don't need a public information campaign because we'll have a system that will be fit for purpose when people need it. And that should be our goal when we recraft a vision for social care. I'm grateful. Uh, Martin Green, Chief Executive of Care England, Caroline Abrams, the Charity Director at Age UK, Natasha Curry, Deputy Director of Policy at the Nuffield Trust and Paul Burstow, uh, himself a former Minister for Care uh, and Chair of the Social Care Institute for Excellence. Thank you all very much indeed. Uh, but that concludes our second panel. Thanks to all of them uh, for taking part and indeed to our sponsors, MSD, uh, for making all of this possible. Mm -hmm.